Wayfarer's Chapel is a national memorial to Emanuel Swedenborg and an ecumenical ministry of the Swedenborgian Church based here in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. We seek to nurture the spiritual journey of all wayfarers traveling through life. Our podcast features our weekly sermon and scripture readings. Enjoy. This is a short reflection from Father Richard Rohr. It's a celebration of the incarnation of Jesus. And it may be news that in the first 1,200 years of Christianity, the central feast of celebration was Easter with the high holy days of Holy Week leading up to a celebration of the resurrection of Christ. But in the 13th century, Francis of Assisi entered the scene. He intuited that we didn't need to wait for God to love us through the cross and resurrection. Francis believed the whole thing started with incarnate love, he popularized what we now take for granted as Christmas, which for many became the major Christian feast. Christmas is the feast of incarnation, when we celebrate God taking human form in the birth of Jesus. Francis realized that since God had become flesh, taken on materiality, physicality, humanity, then we didn't have to wait for Good Friday and Easter to, quote, solve the problem of human sin. The problem was solved from the beginning. It makes sense that Christmas became the great celebratory feast of Christians because it basically says that it's good to be human. It's good to be on this earth. It's good to have a body. It's good to have emotions. We don't need to be ashamed of any of it. God loves matter and physicality. With that insight, it's no wonder Francis went wild over Christmas. Francis believed that trees should be decorated with lights to show their true status as God's creations. And that's exactly what we still do 800 years later. And there's more. When we speak of Advent or preparing for Christmas, we're not just talking about waiting for a little baby Jesus to be born. That already happened 2,000 years ago. In fact, we're welcoming the universal Christ, the cosmic Christ, the Christ that is forever being born, forever being and incarnating in the human soul and into human history. We do have to make room for such a mystery, because right now there is no room in the inn. We see things pretty much in their materiality, but we don't see the light shining through. We don't see the incarnate spirit that is hidden inside of everything material. The early Eastern Church, which too few people in the United States and Western Europe are familiar with, made it very clear that the incarnation of Christ manifests a universal principle. Incarnation meant not just that God became Jesus, but that God said yes to the material universe and physicality itself. Eastern Christianity understands the mystery of incarnation in the universal sense. So it is always Advent because God is forever coming into our world. We're always waiting to see spirit revealing itself through matter. We're always waiting for matter to become a new form in which spirit is revealed. Whenever that happens, we're celebrating Christmas. The gifts of incarnation just keep coming. Perhaps this is enlightenment. And I really love starting off with that because we take for granted this time of the year, the celebrations 
the decorations, the presents, and all the ways that Christmas has become what it is in modern times. And in reading history, I continue to be fascinated that when it comes to these traditions that we are presently taking for granted, this is not how it always has been. In fact, for the majority of Christianity on this planet, it has not been this case. Christmas is a fairly recent invention, only around 800 years or so. So Christmas, literally celebrating Christ in Mass. We gather together as the billion-plus believers and followers on this planet. And it should come as a bit striking that for 1,200 years it did not exist. Easter was the main celebration in the Christian year. And yes, we can ask all kinds of ludicrous questions. Well, how did they boost their retail sales back then? <laughs> what about the Santa Claus rally in the stock market? It should bring a little bit of a smile, a little bit of a chuckle, because the modern version of what we celebrate is not exactly what was historically celebrated. The sacred mystery of the crucifixion, death, burial, and open tomb of the resurrection it will always remain part of this divine mystery. And it does make sense that Easter would have been the main celebration for the majority of time because that was the greatest re reversal in human history, where the worldly powers thought that they had conquered human form, believed that they could put, put someone to death and be done with it. So with the resurrection came a new understanding of what it meant to be God incarnate in the world, that you could not destroy the physical form. And yet, I'm very glad for St. Francis, for his intuitive ability to sense something there that we needed to celebrate. To celebrate this great gift from God of being born, being born into this world, that, that is all part of the celebration. That within the, in this material realm, there is infused in there something sacred and spiritual that we need to celebrate. And I love that expression about the trees decorated with lights. To show the world that these are God's creation and need to be celebrated as a part of God's creation and light them up as God sees God's creation. How God views us. How God views all of God's creation. And I'm glad that this idea caught on, and that we continue to decorate trees with lights and celebration that God is here with us. And that's one of the things that I'm going to have to give Francis of Assisi credit for as well. Some of my earliest childhood memories where it felt like the sacred, the spiritual, the God was here, have to do with those moments in childhood where it was not necessarily a formal service. It was late at night wondering if when Santa might arrive and wondering the mystery of, of uh, all these things as a child, but it was for me the Christmas lights on the house. They were a constant theme throughout the Advent season and it was simply more of a meditative glance at these lights. Why were these lights a big part of Christmas? And everyone, I invite all of us to kind of go back in your own memories, your own experience of childhood to that sacred moment. It may not mean anything to anyone else, but it means something special to you. And the Lord knows what that is. You know what it is. And I'm asking all of us to kind of unpack that a little bit, to go and discover, to plumb the depths within our being. Those moments where Christmas and Advent meant something just a little bit more than the anticipation of a present. And in retrospect, it is still fascinating to consider that the majority of time of Christianity on this planet, 1,200 years, Christmas was not 
a thing celebrated. With all that Jesus said about entering the kingdom of heaven, we must become like a child from Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the child whom he put among them and said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And this set in motion many of other reversals, things that people had dismissed. And they don't have time to get into all the ways that Jesus Christ and his message changed the history and the course of history forever in countless ways that we take for granted, including children, and how children were treated for thousands of years. And here's another reversal. In order to kingdom, enter the kingdom of heaven, you must, we must all become like child and children. Now there's a gift within that. And I think the more that we kind of dwell on what this is, we understand the true nature of God being in purity and innocence. There is power there, true spiritual power. I mean, that's a great gift of performing baptisms right here. Let's see. I've got, I know that I've, I've seen a, at least a few of you, children over here that were baptized. Um, there's... I reference that same piece of scripture and then to connect that with actual children and you see in their eyes how they are viewing the world. And I can, I can enter into a little bit in those moments the power of their presence, the purity of spirit, the way that we all come into this world and we notice this. We all have an affinity for whether it's newborns, whether it's you know, new, new life coming into this world in the form of puppies or kittens. We all have that, they all have that same quality that we naturally gravitate to. It softens our hearts. So that gift of that power is a big part of the reason we do continue to celebrate Christmas, the birth of divinity in our world in human form. I'll share one quick story. The older I get, the more I appreciate little things that used to give me joy when I was a kid. They still give me joy as an adult. And I do have children, and I have a six-year-old. You remember the rains this past Wednesday? There was some flooding. There were some big puddles. I couldn't contain myself. There was a big one. And my six-year-old was in the back, and I, I put a little few extra miles per hour through one, and the, the water went up on both sides. And then, yes, I got encouragement from my son. Whee! Look at that! It was fun. So I did it a few more times. <laughs> and it was fun. I will not deny my, my glee, my joy of going through some puddles with a little extra speed to make it go a little bit higher. And no, I didn't. I didn't uh, try and see if there was people on the side. I made sure nobody was getting hit from my puddles. <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it was just joy. But I think that's true. I mean, here's a truism. I mean, our, our physical bodies are going to go through change. We're constantly in change. But at the deeper level, that essence, that core of who we are, where we come from, and where we're going is the same yesterday, today, and where it will be in the future. If we can connect to that, that's the living Christ in us presently. And that's really the sacred mystery we're all at some level trying to crack the code on. How do we access the eternal in the here and now? Since innocence 
for heaven's angels is the very essence of what is good. We can see that the divine good emanating from the Lord is innocence itself. Inasmuch as it is this good that flows into angels, moves their deepest natures and aligns and adapts them to accept all the blessings of heaven. Much the same happens with infants whose deeper natures are not only formed by the passage of innocence from the Lord, but are also constantly adapted and aligned to accept the good of heavenly love because the good of innocence acts from deep within, being, as already rooted, the very essence of all good. Because innocence is the very heart of all good of heaven, it also affects minds so strongly that people who feel it, which happens at the approach of an angel of the inmost heaven, feel as though they are not under their own control. They are moved by such a joy so taken out of themselves, so to speak, that it seems as though all the pleasure of the world is nothing in comparison. I speak of this from having experienced it. That's a quote from the Christian mystic Emanuel Swedenborg in Heaven and Hill 282. So I want to land this on the scripture reading I read this morning from the Gospel of Luke. Nothing impossible, nothing is impossible with God. So if the holidays are challenging, if you feel like life is not turning out the way that you would thought it would, you would hope for, if you felt like giving up some days, know that nothing is impossible for God. God will continue to use your present circumstances in order to bend that towards the good, bend that towards the light. In other words, God will glorify you and your circumstances. Use everything that you've experienced in order to do this. And that is the central theme of the gospel reading today, where Luke, in the Luke, where the angel of the Lord speaks to Mary and says the following, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. For nothing will be impossible with God. And I'm just going to say part of that would be, Lord, heal my unbelief. Heal my unbelief. Let's heal our unbelief. Because in those times of trial, it's really our belief that we can't do something. The message today and the message every day is the same. Nothing is impossible with God. God will use our circumstance, will enter into it, will sustain us, will get us through, will change us, will shift us. One other short reflection from Father Rohr saying yes to body and spirit. Describing Mary, Mary is the model of the faith to which God calls all of us, a total and unreserved yes to God's request to be present in the world and for God to work through us. God desires to love others unconditionally in and through us. Those who live with such a faith can truly be called God's instruments. God wants light to shine through us. And so our first response to this call is simply to heed it and remain open to divine grace. Mary said her yes to God, and God was able to become incarnate in her. She gave birth to Christ by being so totally open to God's spirit that the Christ child could be born. The question then becomes for us, how do we also give birth as Mary did? There is no mention of moral worthiness, achievement, or preparedness in Mary, only humble trust and surrender. She gives us all, therefore, a bottomless hope in our own little place. If we ourselves try to manage God or manufacture our own worthiness by any perfection or performance principle whatsoever, we will never give birth to the Christ, but only more of ourselves. 
Whenever the material and the spiritual coincide, there is the Christ. Jesus fully accepted that human divine identity and walked it into history. Henceforth, the Christ comes again whenever we are able to see the spiritual and the material coexisting in any moment, in any event, and in any person. All matter reveals spirit, and spirit needs matter to show itself. What I like to call the forever coming of Christ happens whenever and wherever we allow this to be utterly true for us. This is how God continually breaks into history. God broke into history so many points in our past. God continues to break into our history right now. Our task is simply to be receptive to that continuous gift of the Holy Spirit, to be able to let go of our old identities of the past, and to embrace a new future, a new identity. When we do collapse those two, when we're able to feel that experience, there is a breakthrough. And it does require an integration. It's not just intellectual. It's a, it's a movement from the head, perhaps more down to the heart. And that journey, we have to have a balance between divine love and divine wisdom. Our understanding has to be in balance with our hearts. But when we do that, when we do that work, when we experience it, there is a shift. And for some, that shift has been so radical that they no longer identify with who they were in the past. That was identified as the old self. When we are putting on a new identity in Christ, we are no longer associated with whatever those labels were of the past. And it can become such a powerful thing. that the continually evolving version of ourselves, they become just like Mary hearing those first words, where we too need to be open and receptive to a new identity. We need to be ready to receive those gifts of spirit, the Holy Spirit in our lives in the present. We need to lean more towards God that is breaking through into our world in a way that celebrates the incarnation of God with us, Emmanuel, a God for whom nothing is impossible. May the Lord so help us all. Amen. And Merry Christmas, everyone.